Hi there, everyone, and welcome back to our Facebook Live question and answer session. I am Dr. Rami Caldas of the Caldas Center. We are looking forward to answering your questions tonight. It's great to have you back. So September is Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Awareness Month. So we'll be chatting quite a bit about PCOS tonight. However, please feel free to ask any women's health questions you may have. I love being surprised. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions on Facebook already. If you have not sent in your question yet, feel free to post it to Facebook Live and we will do our best to answer it. If you would like to submit an anonymous question, please contact us using Facebook Messenger and indicate that you'd like to share your question but remain anonymous. That would be fantastic because all thoughts are good thoughts because it creates further thought and, and generates all kinds of uh, answers and um, to help people out. Okay, so before we begin, a reminder that this question and answer session is meant to be for informational purposes only. If you have situations of serious health concerns, please consult your doctor. If you'd like to contact the Calda Center, visit caldacenter.com or call us at 920-886-2299 and we would love to talk to you. Remember, no referral is ever needed to visit the Calda Center. So, first question from Don. I have polycystic ovary syndrome and my cycles are always irregular. But last year I started having them more frequently. Can your body change for better and become fertile on your own? There is variability, Dawn. That is a, a very common thing. Sometimes people with polycystic ovaries go in both directions. So they're having regular periods, what they think are regular periods, and then it goes back to not having them so regularly. And they can be variable. Sometimes the um, the cycle length can be 30 days, the next cycle is 20 days, the next cycle it could be 45 or 60 days, or you might go for six months without. And so, the, 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 but one key uh, thing to remember is that some of these cycles are not actually cycles, but rather simply withdrawal bleeds that are happening and you're not, they are not actually induced by, by an ovulation. A real cycle is induced by ovulation. And 99% of women have their period start about 14 days after that ovulation. But sometimes you can have bleeding, as too many women know, but you actually didn't ovulate and it's just bleeding that seems like a period, but it might not hurt as much or it might be lighter or heavier. And it's hard to tell whether it was a real cycle or not. But yes, there can be variation and it, can be, it doesn't even have to do with... Um, weight change for example if there's a large weight gain or weight loss even not that large let's say uh, because uh, with polycystic ovary syndrome it is so very challenging to control weight um, and uh, let's say there's only a 15 pound weight loss for someone who's weighing 300 pounds for example then even that slight bit can dramatically improve your your cycle uh, cycling of your ovaries but thank you Don for that question this is an anonymous question. My husband and I have done two failed IUIs with injectables for a second baby. What are our other options? I feel like we are completely wa waiting money, wasting money at this point on IUIs when we are only getting one or two follicles with a new protocol of Clomid, Letrozole, and injectables together. All right, so in fact, if you look, that's a very good question and I know how frustrating that, that is. If you look at the, the pregnancy rates for Clomid Letrozole compared to uh, baseline pregnancy rates, let's say for an average couple in their 20s who are, have not had a challenge already to become pregnant, they're actually not too bad. With insemination, you, you're probably looking at about 12% or so. Uh, some studies say it suggests as, as low as 9%. With, and, and so, but with injectables, that's going to be significantly higher. Now, any given cycle is, you're not gonna have better than about a 20% chance of getting pregnant any given cycle. Even with in vitro fertilization, the average delivery, the like live birth rate for an in vitro fertilization cycle in this country uh, last year was reported at 24.7%, which is obviously disappointing. Only a one in four chance of having a baby after investing that kind of money into, um, into an IVF cycle. And so 
What I would say is that one has to remember that of all human conceptions, probably two thirds of them, we estimate from pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and IVF are actually not genetically the usual thing. And that is the biggest limiting factor. And so you end up with um, a very high uh, pregnancy loss rate that is not recognized, okay? So the recognized pregnancy loss rate is, uh, sorry about that, uh, let me turn my phone off, there we go. And um, the, the, um, the uh, pregnancy loss uh, rate that is recognized is about 20%, but in fact, people can be conceiving and they are not actually uh, missing their period. And so I know it feels like you're wasting your money, however, it may be worth trying just one or two more cycles, even while you're pursuing an IVF cycle. Additionally, make sure that everything, all the T's have been crossed and all the I's have been dotted. I've seen situations frequently where, uh, where um, an, uh, a, a tubal dye study has not been done in any way, shape, or form. I've seen situations where laboratory analysis has been incomplete. Just make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and then even as you may be pursuing one or two more cycles of uh, injectable medications uh, with clomid or letrozole or not, uh, you know, get that IVF consult with a reputable program, really look at the program, really know that it's not just a, a, a factory uh, and, and, and that's the, the, the dual approach I would take uh, to achieve your goal because at the Calda Center we just don't give up, okay? Until we achieve people's goals with them. Thank you for the question. From Beth, I've read that not everyone with PCOS has polycystic ovaries. Is that true? That can be true, but fundamentally, it is part of the three things that define polycystic ovary syndrome. The thing is, you, have, you can have polycystic ovaries and you can have polycystic ovary syndrome. In Europe, it's pretty much an ultrasonic diagnosis from ultrasound. They look at the ovaries and if they look polycystic, then someone has polycystic ovaries. But there's an insulin and resistance in one of the cell types of the ovary. But you don't necessarily have to have the whole polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a metabolic syndrome. That's why you can have polycystic, people with polycystic ovaries who are quite thin, that are not exercising three hours a day or running, you know, training for a marathon, but they're quite thin, but they're still anovulatory and their ovaries still have over 20 early follicles in each one of them when you look with the ultrasound. Then you have the people with the syndrome who are usually suffering with, uh, you know, heavier weight and hair growth on the face and, um, and uh, the metabolic components, like a very high insulin level, very high, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, hemoglobin A1C, about 10 to 20% at time of diagnosis will actually have diabetes diagnosed. And so that's all very important, but if, if, you, you, if you don't have polycystic looking ovaries, I don't know, I think there might be something else going on that might be needing to be evaluated. Let's say you're not having periods. Well, almost all the time, it's one of three things. It's polycystic ovaries or polycystic ovary syndrome. It's thyroid dysfunction or prolactin dysfunction. Yes, there are other hormonal and physical entities that can cause you not to be having periods regularly. No doubt. However, those are the three places you should be looking and thinking about. And you, after this talk, you may be uh, way better equipped to ask your doctor the questions that she or he may not be asking themselves when you see them and help them along a bit. So thank you for the question, Beth. And Stacy has a question. Are there any specific diets that help women with polycystic ovary syndrome? Yes, there are. It's a great idea not to eat too many carbohydrates when you have polycystic ovary uh, syndrome because the metabolism is not the same. And so you have a hyperinsulinemia and you have a really uh, easy time storing fat but not getting rid of it. And so carbohydrates are not a great idea and therefore a high protein, not a high fat, but a high protein diet uh, with, uh, which is uh, well balanced and uh, is the way to go, but the junk food will do you in. It's just not a good idea at all. And um, 
and you can, uh, you know, the keto diet may be considered a reasonable approach for someone with polycystic ovary syndrome, or something like a, um, a celiac disease diet would actually work quite well for you also. So yes, there are things, and you can always call our friends at Nutritional Healing over in Appleton, who become very specific for the individual with testing and such, and, uh, and help you figure out how, what your body reacts well to and what it doesn't react well to, so you can decrease the inflammatory processes in your body and start losing weight and overcome polycystic ovary syndrome in a very natural, um, uh, you know, homeopathic way too. It, it isn't only medications that, uh, that can help you. Diet is very important. Thank you for that question, Stacy. Are there different severities of polycystic ovary syndrome? From JC. Hey, you bet there are. Thanks for asking that question. And this is one of the things that totally confuses other docs. And it's like, it's a continuum. And so from just having mild polycystic appearing ovaries to having the full blown syndrome with adrenal involvement and, uh, and hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance throughout the whole body versus just a little bit of insulin resistance at, 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 at the ovarian level. And so the, the whole spectrum is there. And so it's all gray and, and folks have the hardest time getting past that. They think it's black and white. You either have it or you don't. Well, no, that's not the case. And that's why some people with polycystic ovaries have periods every 45 days, just infrequently. Over 35 days is considered abnormally long for a cycle length. And then others never have a period. And so, and so yes, there are different severities and different components expressed with polycystic ovary syndrome. And it's all fundamentally goes back to what's going on in the, in the genes. And so thank you, Jay-Z. Just a reminder, if you would like to set up a time to speak with us at the Calda Center, you can call us at 920-886-2299 or visit caldacenter.com, or do what some people do. They just drop by and say hi. I, we don't know if we'll have quite the appointment right then and there. If you do that, give us a heads up a little bit. But come and check the place out. Have some cookies. But, uh, of course, that's not so great for your polycystic ovary syndrome. Hey, is it possible to have both polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis? If yes, is treatment different then? What about getting pregnant? Does it become much more difficult having both conditions? It's not much more difficult, Emily. Um, I see people on a daily basis with both of them, all right? And I, I have not read yet definitive evidence that these two things coincide, go together. But I, I tend to think, just anecdotally, that there may be an association because I do find it together so frequently. And uh, there's scarcely uh, a day in the operating room that goes by that I don't, that I'm operating on someone with endometriosis and there is clearly polycystic ovaries. And usually I know it obviously beforehand uh, because we've done ultrasounds and uh, laboratory analysis that are consistent uh, and the findings are consistent with polycystic ovary syndrome. And so what about getting pregnant? Yes, the thing is polycystic ovary syndrome is the number one you know, reason for ovulatory dysfunction cause of, of, of uh, not getting pregnant. Endometriosis, as you know, reduces fertility by about 50%. Getting rid of it is dramatic and helping you to get pregnant, but you have to actually get rid of it. You can't just like burn it. That might actually make the situation worse. And so, and so I would say that it is totally doable and you can either treat one, well, it's best if you treat both, uh, but, uh, and, and they can be treated with medication. But uh, for endometriosis, like I said, you actually need to remove it for, for the situation to get better on the getting pregnant front. But you might want to, if it's not too symptomatic, try treating the polycystic ovary syndrome medically first, see if you're getting regular cycles, and see if you don't get pregnant without getting rid of the endometriosis. Endometriosis reduces fertility by 50%. It does not reduce it by 100%. And therefore, I know plenty of people who've gotten pregnant with untreated endometriosis but obviously if someone is having symptoms then of, of, uh, of endometriosis, then it's not unreasonable to take care of it because they can feel better while they're trying to get pregnant. So thank you for that question, Emily. And a question from an anonymous uh, person. Thank you for writing in. I'm recently married and my husband and I want to start trying to conceive now, knowing it may take a while. 
I have purchased the BBT thermometer to help try to determine ovulation. I am not 100% sure how to read these temps or what I'm supposed to be do looking at to see if I'm ovulating. Also, I have purchased ovulation test strips to try after my next cycle. Is there any other things or ways I can help improve chances or test for ovulation? Please don't, okay? Please don't. You'll drive yourself crazy. And those things are sometimes hard to read and confusing. I recommend to my patients that in fact, if they are having a regular cycle, like I said, 99% of women are ovulating 14 days before they have their period. Now, if you have a moving target of a period, like, okay, this cycle is 45 days long and this one is 29 and the next one is 60, obviously that's a challenge. However, then you need an evaluation and you need to start removing unknown variables, all right? So you, if it's a situation with polycystic ovaries, then that needs to be treated and your cycles will become regular and you may be able to become pregnant on your own by simply having regular ovulation, which can be achieved with medications, either fertility drugs and or metformin. Or, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, um, uh, I would not try the, the testing though. I would not, <laughs> because you'll, you'll end up testing for 30 days in a row or something like that and it becomes very frustrating and discouraging. And therefore, I would simply, if it's irregular, find out why and, and then treat it. If it's a thyroid issue, thyroid medication will take care of it. You'll normalize, then you can become pregnant because you can have regular cycles and you know when your ovulation is gonna come. But and remember, sperm lives for four days and the egg lives only for 12 to 24 hours. Therefore, and knowing that every other day is the best way to get pregnant, having intercourse every other day, you should have intercourse beginning four days before ovulation, then two days before ovulation, and then the day of ovulation, okay? So let's say, for example, you have a 28-day cycle. You're ovulating day 14. Therefore, the best time to have intercourse is day 10, 12, 14. Throw away those, those kits and those temperature testing things. The basal body temperature testing is very bad for trying to figure out for that specific cycle when you should have intercourse to get pregnant because it's based on a progesterone rise which happens after ovulation. Remember, I said the egg only lives for 12 to 24 hours. Therefore, if your temperature has risen by this minute amount, first of all, you may miss it. Second of all, you've missed ovulation altogether and you're too late. So don't do that. You're gonna drive yourself crazy. Okay, thank you for that question. Excellent question. From Jenny, any advice on taking Ovistol instead of metformin? You know, the metformin works in such a way that it's an insulin sensitizer. And so that's why we keep going back to it. But metformin also has significant side effects. So the diarrhea, the nausea, usually if you go slowly up on the medication, those side effects subside. So other uh, medications for uh, hyperinsulinemia uh, don't work quite in that same way and therefore um, they, um, they may not have uh, an equally successful uh, effect. But thank you for the question. And it may turn out that over time, Avastol will be as effective, but right now uh, metformin is what is recommended if it's tolerated. From Anonymous, are there other medications besides metformin that treat PCOS that don't have <laughs> the bad side effects? We've just covered that. Thanks for the question. And so, uh, but it, it, you can treat, use fertility drugs if you're not having a, a, an easy time with the metformin. Letrozole or, uh, or um, Clomid are the ones to use and uh, they can uh, be used uh, in conjunction with injectable medications or even in conjunction with prednisone to get difficult to ovulate people to actually ovulate. And uh, you, um, you succeed most of the time, almost all the time you can get ovulation to happen. Not all of the time, sometimes it's very difficult. And you can find out if it's going to be difficult by how high the anti-malarian hormone level is. So I've had people with AMH levels, anti-malarian malarian hormone of about 130 before, extremely high and they're very difficult to make ovulate. And, uh, and so, uh, if they're not tolerating metformin, we have to be very careful with the fertility drugs because 
those people are predisposed to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is very uncomfortable and does increase the risk of miscarriage if that happens when you become pregnant. So thanks for the question. So just a reminder, to speak with us, you can call 920-886-2299 or visit caldacenter.com. No referral is needed. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So from Jacqueline, some researchers think that PCOS will one day be recognized as an autoimmune disease. Do you have any thoughts on it possibly being an autoimmune disease? I think that is a distinct possibility. As we talked about, just anecdotally, it sure seems that there's a correlation between endometriosis and PCOS, even though I don't have the papers to prove it. As we know, endometriosis is an autoimmune disease. And so it may be that these are the, the, the genetics, the genes that, that cause expression of both of these entities live somewhere near, near each other and are turned off and turned on by those uh, genes that control whether others are turned on and turned off. And so I think that uh, that is a distinct possibility, especially because we know that if you give prednisone with Clomid, people with polycystic ovary syndrome will actually ovulate more readily. And so that implies that the immune, it might be immune mediated, but the proof is not quite yet there. Very elaborate studies have been done and nothing definitive has been um, uh, concluded. Thank you for the question, Jacqueline. What is the difference between PCOS and endometriosis? Well, polycystic ovary syndrome, you need a triad usually to think, uh, think about three things of polycystic ovary syndrome classically uh, uh, to define it. That is when you have higher androgen levels, male hormones, you have irregular cycles or anovulation, and you also have polycystic appearing ovaries. Now, endometriosis, on the other hand, is when you have the lining of the uterus growing outside of the uterus. So 100% of women will have retrograde menstruation, meaning when you have a period, the flow goes backwards. Ooh, okay, so, but it happens to all women. But only about 10 or 15%, the immune system will not clear it out. And that lining, which was growing in the, in the, in, in the uterus, inside the uterus, starts growing outside the uterus. And it's growing on the nerves going to the uterus, it's growing on the bowel, it's growing on the appendix, it's growing on the diaphragm, it's growing all over the place and wreaking havoc with inflammation and, uh, and, and scarring. And so that's why it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, and so the symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome or anovulation, irregular menses, so on. Whereas with endometriosis, the symptoms are usually pain with intercourse, uh, pain with menses, usually beginning a few days before menses and ending uh, a couple of days into the flow and uh, or getting better at least. And, um, you know, it, it can, but all, you know, endometriosis can present a lot like irritable bowel syndrome because it can affect bowel function. And so that is the distinct difference between polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis, both of which, Holly, can cause significant decrease in fertility, of course. From Alexi, after I had surgery last year for PCOS and I needed, as I believe was said, holes drilled for my uterus to drain, I had an IUD placed per doctor's suggestion. How early should this be removed if we want to start trying to get pregnant? Okay, so the holes drilled if to, for your uterus to drain, uh, essentially that's called ovarian drilling, and we don't even know why it works. But when you pop some of these little cysts in the ovaries, when you have polycystic ovaries, you know, you have at least 20 on either side that are seen, and usually when I find polycystic ovaries, there are, there are hundreds, hundreds of, of antral follicles, early follicles, tiny follicles that are refusing to come forward. And when you pop a lot of them, like when I do ovarian drilling, I might pop say 40 on each ovary, then, um, then the ovaries for whatever reason for about a year will function. It used to be uh, more regularly. It used to be that we'd do a wedge resection. We'd actually wedge out the ovary, but you know that caused more scar tissue. And for people who are trying to get pregnant, it's not very nice to be thinking that parts of their ovaries are being removed either. And so that then allows your ovaries to cycle and your uterus then sheds its lining when you go through normal ov ovulatory cycles. They put in Mirena IUD to uh, kind of counterbalance the high estrogen levels associated with polycystic ovaries and polycystic ovary syndrome. And so that should be removed probably the month before you want to try to get pregnant. 
I've had a lot of people get pregnant the month after because once you remove that progesterone, it's not like um, a Depo-Provera shot or something that may linger in your system for up to a year afterwards, all right? Pretty much a month or two after the IUD is taken out, the Mirena is taken out, uh, you will get back to your normal ovulatory function and your normal cycles unless your polycystic ovaries uh, are, uh, are not allowing you to do so. Okay. Thank you, Alexi. From Jenna, once menopausal, will PCOS symptoms reduce or go away? This is an excellent question, Jenna. So the challenge with this is that with, with when, when someone gets menopausal, what happens? Well, their metabolism slows down and they gain weight or if they're eating the same amount and the same things. So that's not your polycystic ovaries then causing you to gain weight anymore. It's your menopause. And what happens to, when you get menopausal? You actually, you know, notice our grandmothers, they have a little bit of a mustache sometimes and so on and so on. And my gosh, well, those are symptoms of polycystic ovary syndrome. And so while you don't, while you don't have the same, you know, a heavy duty uh, production of hormones from the ovaries when you get menopausal and you have polycystic ovary syndrome, you have menopausal symptoms, some of which can be confused with PCOS symptoms. And so they don't really go away, but they may be ameliorated, they may be reduced, but be aware that uh, they, there is overlap in the symptoms. Thank you, Jenna. From Crystal, what does it mean if my AMH level is really low? So what that means, uh, Crystal, is that uh, the ovarian reserve may not be the greatest. And so it means that the number of actual eggs in your ovaries may not be a large number. And that will be harder to get um, pregnant with a very low AMH level. I've had a few people become pregnant, however, with AMH levels as low as 0 0.3, but I haven't unfortunately had anyone become pregnant with their owner eggs when it was 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. Donor egg can be used uh, for that, those people. However, I, like I said, I, I don't, once you get people to ovulate, the quality of the egg is not indicated by the AMH level, but you just have to get them to have a good response and, uh, and uh, see what happens. And, and so um, that is what it means. A, a poor ovarian reserve is what a low AMH level is. We really prefer it between 1.5 and 4.5. And like I said, it can be really high in ovulation, can be very difficult to achieve when it's very high. But on the other hand, uh, if, uh, if it's uh, very low, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, with a, a moderately high FSH level, then that, that's going to be a challenge because egg quality may not be the greatest. Thank you, Crystal. All right, it looks like we're out of time tonight again. I cannot believe it. It goes by so fast. Thank you to everyone who joined the conversation. If we did not get to your question, we will follow up with you in the next few days. A quick reminder that if you'd like to speak with us further, visit calvacenter.com or give, us, uh, give our office a call at 920-886-2299. As for tonight, thanks again for joining me. This is the best way I can think of to end the day. Thank you again for spending time with us, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.